Hello everybody! Good morning to those who are joining us from Europe and uh, good afternoon or good evening. I know that there are a lot of people joining us from Australia and New Zealand as we are doing an interview with Dr. Berger who is himself in Australia. So, as you might have noticed, for those of you who follow our webinars quite uh, often, that we are finally in our studios. So that's a new, nice and new change. And we are doing something new today, uh, something that we haven't done before and something that we hope that our viewers will appreciate. Uh, that's an interview webinar. Today's webinar has been one of the most popular ones, actually, uh, up until this point in, in, in RNet history. We've had uh, just shy of 400 people registered. So, um, let's start off with a bit of an introduction regarding the uh, problems that uh, we're going to discuss today because i know that most people that are, have registered today actually uh this is the first rnet webinar that they are attending so i'm just going to give you a bit of uh, an intro and then we will jump right into the interview so uh, the main topic of today is the uh, airborne transmission of, of COVID-19. So it has been proven many times over and now the CDC and many other uh, government organizations uh, already have acknowledged that the coronavirus can be transmitted through the air. So that means it can stay uh, airborne for several hours uh, in these small particles. So essentially uh, there are several transmission routes and the most popular ones and the most known ones are these uh, contact transmissions. So this is why we keep that two meter distance, right? So if somebody sneezes on you, you can get infected. But more and more evidence started to pile up over the last year and now it has kind of become irrefutable that COVID also tr is transmitted through the air. So it doesn't really, the two meter distance is not really enough. The uh, masks and shields are not really enough. We do really have to think about ventilation. And why is that? Well, what studies have shown is that uh, with proper ventilation, uh, you can achieve, uh, you can uh, increase the time in which these COVID particles, these aerosols, uh, leave the room uh, tenfold. Essentially, you know, in a room where there's no ventilation and, uh, and these particles are just roaming about, uh, they can stay airborne in, in, in for even a couple of hours and uh, sometimes by mechanical ventilation, sometimes just by opening a window, uh, you can, you know, shorten this time significantly and make indoor spaces a lot safer. So how can you tell if you have enough ventilation? Well. It's not only uh, the COVID particles, the, uh, the, the, the aerosol particles infected with COVID that you, you know, release. If you are a human and if you are breathing in that room, you are also uh, releasing CO2. So we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. And CO2 can be actually used as a proxy for measuring how well is the ventilation in that room and whether or not you are at higher risk of uh, contracting or transmitting uh, COVID. And one of the things, and this is where Aronet steps in, one of the things that you can do to increase the safety of your indoor environment is to actually get a CO2 meter. And this is Aronet, this is the uh, CO2 meter that we are manufacturing ourselves. So it measures CO2, so the big number you see here on the screen is the CO2 measurement. It also measures uh, relative humidity, temperature, air pressure, 
It has a uh, handy Bluetooth app for historical data reading, um, as well as, you know, changing uh, some settings, setting alert thresholds. So for example, when the air in the room becomes, you know, uh, too saturated with CO2, it will give you an audio, both an audio and a visual warning that you have to do something to increase the ventilation in the room. Uh, but it doesn't end there. It's, it's, it's a very nice standalone product as it is, but we understand that, for example, in a lot of situations, especially in a school environment or in offices and all of that, you want uh, centralized data gathering. So what we also have is kind of a base station to which you can wirelessly connect up to a hundred of those devices. So essentially the setup would be, you would have, let's say a school, and you ha would have one of these devices in uh, each classroom uh, that would give you, you know, direct measurements right now and would inform, uh, you know, teachers and staff that, you know, action should be taken if the CO2 level is too high. So you either open the windows or increase the ventilation. But then what you can do is uh, get all the data centrally to a central kind of base station and that works on the 868 megahertz uh, frequency in Europe and 920 in Australia and New Zealand and the US as well. So it's it's a very low radio frequency that allows the signal to travel far, much further than Wi-Fi and things like that. So you can cover even a large school with just one base station. And then you get all the data centralized, centrally. So you can make reports, you can check, you know, which classrooms are, you know, more problematic than others. You can plan ahead, you know, things like that. Get uh, alarms directly from the base station. So it comes with kind of uh, a web server on top of it and its own internal memory. So it's quite an advanced piece of equipment. And it comes with free software where you can just, you know, open your laptop, your phone, your your tablet, whatever, whatever connect directly to the base station and, uh, and, and get your readings. And as a uh, next step, as an op, logical next step we also have kind of a cloud solution which where you can have for example if you have multiple schools in in one district you can have multiple location support and you can see all of that in a single dashboard right so uh, this this the system is like scalable on several levels so you can get just a single co2 reader that you can just carry around use it wherever you want um, you can have it locally networked with the base station and you can also get um, external access. So uh, this is about Aranet and if you want to get more information about that, uh, you can see on the presentation screen right there, there's our website uh, rnet.com or you can write to us directly uh, with, uh, to info at rnet.com. And with this, uh, we will jump into the uh, interviews. Oh, so one last thing. Uh, this is kind of uh, what I typically end all of the presentations with. And this is a quotation from William Thompson or uh, better known as Lord Kelvin. And uh, in the end of last century, no, the beginning of last century, he said a very smart thing that you can only improve what you can measure. And I think this rings quite, uh, you know, heavily in the COVID context. If you want to improve your situation, you want to know where you are right now. So um, Arnet is kind of about all about bringing this measurement, you know, as easily, uh, you know, to you as possible, as easily and as, as precisely as possible. So with that, without further ado, let's jump in to the interview with our guest today, uh, David Berger. 
I know that a lot of you, when you registered, you uh, sent in a lot of questions for Dr. Berger. I have filtered them right here, and uh, many of them repeated several times. So um, I guess um, I guess I've I've kind of tried to construct it uh, in a way to kind of get the most popular questions. Um, to, to be asked in these uh, next 30 minutes where I'm gonna interview uh, Dr. David Berger and then you will have the chance to ask your own questions in the YouTube comments section and you can actually start doing that already now once whilst we are talking and then during the last 20 minutes of our uh, of our presentation of our webinar, we will do the questions from the audience. So to introduce you to Dr. David Berger, he is one of the leading public voices in Australia when it comes to um, when it comes to airborne COVID transmission. He is a general practitioner and an emergency doctor. So he has um, experience on the front lines of, of this battle against COVID. And he is a public voice in Australia. He has uh, driven discussions in uh, things like uh, personal protective equipment, refugee rights, uh, global healthcare corruption, and uh, things like that. And he has two popular uh, Twitter accounts. One of them is his personal one, and the other one is CO2 uh, gorillas, where he educates people uh, regarding this uh, CO, uh, this COVID aerosol transmission, and also uh, gives people kind of this platform to post their own readings, what they do with CO2 meters, and where you know where it's more dangerous and where it's less dangerous. So, hi, Dr. Berger. Yeah, hi, Tooms. Nice, nice to be with you. Nice to nice to meet nice to talk to you. I know it's uh, quite late in uh, Australia, and it's uh, very nice of you to uh, to agree to do this so late, so that you know our colleagues in Europe can also join in the webinar. So you have been very vocally active since uh, March last year, and that's been almost a year now. So how has this uh, year been for you? How have people started to listen more or has it been going in the opposite direction? How do you feel? Um, yeah, I mean, I, this, this really started through, I have to say, absolute fear and terror that I felt uh, at the end of February last year when we had a demonstration uh, from our infection control nurse in the hospital of how we were going to look after uh, COVID patient. Now, at that time, you know, I and others in, in in the Western countries, you know, many of us were already looking at what was happening in China and elsewhere and the developing pandemic in Italy and going, you know, this is an air airborne disease. Um, and we saw through February and into March a, a general downgrading of precautions in the UK and then in Australia. Um, so, you know, I, I just watched this presentation of how we were supposed to uh, uh, look after COVID patients with just, my, my stomach just fell through the floor as I stood there and watched what we were supposed to do. It felt like there was a, there was a kind of a freight train coming towards me because it just seemed so obvious uh, that this was, um, uh, that this was just not going to work. <laughs> So at that point, with the other doctors in my hospital, we really started advocating for, uh, you know, for airborne PPE, for airborne precautions standard, for a full infection control system looking much more like an Ebola system uh, than you would just for like an infectious gastroenteritis. Um, and we met an enormous amount of resistance, uh, and and that really has continued to this day, I would say. So, uh, along with many others in Australia and around the world, um, we have looked at 
the massive numbers of not just healthcare worker infections in hospitals, but of patients getting infected when they go into hospital. Uh, and I've just seen this, this, you know, kind of tidal wave uh, through the year. And it's it's been, I think, you ask how the year's been, it's certainly been the most uh, frustrating, interesting, and educative year of my life. I had no idea that when faced with clear evidence of how they should deal with a problem, humans as a group could so resolutely look the other way. Uh, and, um, you know, we saw this in Australia. I mean, we've had, thankfully, relatively few cases here in Australia. We had a moderate-sized outbreak in Melbourne uh, from June from June through into October, which was completely eliminated with a strict lockdown. Uh, but we had over 4,000 healthcare workers infected. We had hospital departments closed. We had emergency departments closed. Uh, we had huge star sickness due to uh, COVID. And that's similar to how it's been uh, in other countries, like in the UK. And back in January, there were one week, there were 52,000 UK staff off sick with COVID. Uh, they've had uh, nearly a thousand deaths there in healthcare worker staff, almost certainly an underestimate. Um, so, you know, as time has gone on, yes, I mean, it's wrong to say there hasn't been progress. There's been enormous progress. Um, I mean, for a start, you know, who at the beginning of 2020, frankly, had ever heard of an aerosol scientist? And now <laughs> we kind of, they were aerosol scientists that kind of tripped off my tongue where I'm writing it about 20 times a day. Um, you are a rock so, star now. Yeah, exactly. They are the superstars. They are the Bruce Willis here to save the world. So, you know, we, uh, uh, and I think particularly in the last couple of months, there's been an awful lot of movement and people are just looking around going, you know, we have to do something different. Uh, and, and there's increasing recognition uh, of the importance of airborne spread in, in controlling this virus. Uh, in, in all aspects, in the community, in healthcare, etc. Uh, and I think a lot of people are also thinking, you know, the next airborne virus may be worse, so we better get this one right now. So you mentioned beforehand that that now the the evidence is like uh, irrefutable. And what is what is the strongest evidence? So how how do we know that COVID is airborne? I mean, there's there's a whole a whole variety of things, and there is a huge amount now published evidence on it. I mean, we have uh, these super spreading events. I mean, this super, we, we have, there's, there's a database now, well over 2,000 super spreading events. Some of them are absolutely enormous. Uh, I think of all the, uh, of all the uh, things that we've, we've got, it's those events. I mean, going back to the, Kind of seminal event which was in early March last year in uh, Washington State in Skagit uh, when uh, I think it was 52 members of an 80 person choir uh, got infected during a two hour choir practice and a number of them died um, and, and we know that uh, from experimental studies that talking, singing, shouting, coughing aerosolizes the virus. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so this was the first, there have been so many, and, you know, there was a, there, I mean, I'm saying there was a yodeling festival in Switzerland in September, which nearly collapsed the local hospital. It produced so many cases. Um, we have seen plenty of evidence of infections at a distance, which could only happen with aerosol spread. Um, looking, for instance, at the Diamond Princess cruise ship, uh, back in uh, February last year in Japan, uh, you know, uh, I think your guest next week actually, uh, uh, Professor Jimenez published on this, looking at the dynamics of the, the rampant uh, spread on that cruise ship, that could only have been aerosol spread. Here in Australia, we have effectively set up, uh, without intending to, quite a good experimental system. So we quarantined every arrival in this country for 14 days in a hotel. Now, these are generally city hotels, 
uh, well, they're always sitting in hotels, quite close to the airport, sort of holiday in, no motel type things. Um, and they are set up for droplet and contact uh, transmission. And we have, uh, so for instance, to date, the corridors outside guest rooms have been green zoned. No PPE required. You don't have to wear a mask, really? anything. Because, yeah, absolutely. Because of course, if it's if it's uh, if it's droplet spread or contact spread, it's going to stay in the rooms, isn't it? Well, so we had then have the security guard sitting at the end of the corridor, who never goes into the rooms, suddenly gets infected. We then have had the absurd situation of uh, the public health authorities. I mean, I, they're doing their job and they're looking for the cause, but they'll literally look through 500 hours of CCTV footage to see if there was somewhere that he had unauthorized contact or went into the room or, or whatever and they don't find it and it's because the villain is hidden the villain is hidden in the air floating in the air last week in melbourne we had a case where uh, there were there was a family all of them infected in the room uh, and then the guest in the room opposite became infected wow. so the virus traveled into the corridor and then across and through uh, into the other, um, uh, into the other uh, uh, guest room. So you know we've got a whole heap of evidence uh, that, that this is how the virus is spread. And also, you know, we know from lab studies. There's another preprint published, in fact, today from Australia, looking at the aerosolization of particles with talking, coughing, shouting, and comparing it actually to medical procedures such as using high flow oxygen and using non-invasive ventilation. And these simple factors, these simple acts of being alive produce large amounts of aerosol. So, um, you know. So even if you're not talking, you can just like produce the aerosol as well. Yeah, if you're breathing. If but just... as soon as you start talking, I think today's paper showed it increases by 30 times. Oh, wow. Of course, it's different for different people, and that's, that's an issue. Some people produce vastly more aerosols than others, and why that is, is not certain. But um, so, so what we know is that there is everyday aerosol production from human beings simply as a function of being alive, and that that increases in certain situations. Uh, particularly shouting, singing, uh, coughing, um, and um, uh, but that is, you know that, that you actually don't need uh, to have a particular cause for aerosol production. And, and just getting technical for a minute, you know, in the medical field, uh, we've really been been breaking our heads over the last year because of this concept of an aerosol generating procedure where it has been said that you only need airborne protective equipment to protect against aerosols if the patient is having an aerosol generating procedure uh, which has been said to be something like an intubation where you put a tube into a patient's uh, uh, airway uh, or, or other similar things. In fact, the evidence is that you produce hundreds of times more aerosols simply by coughing than putting a tube into somebody's airway. So this has been a huge sticking point. Um, and I think one of the things, again, that I have really had rammed home to me this year is that once a dogma becomes entrenched and accepted, it is extremely hard or new information to uh, shift that fixed position. Yeah. This is this is this correlates to my next question. So you said, you know, now we're talking about this mountain of evidence, but then you then you said that you have had, you know, very large kind of resistance to your claims and all of that. And why do you think that is? What is the counter arguments on the other side? Why why is it so hard for the establishment to accept it? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you said to me a year ago, this is a hill that a lot of people were prepared for a lot of other people to die on, I would have said you were crazy. 
Um, but actually, that seems to be the case. Um, I think that uh, we have to go back into history. There, uh, this has been going on, as it turns out, for over a hundred years. Uh, you know, going back to the time of, of uh, uh, sort of my medical predecessors, Dr. Joseph Semmelweis and Louis Pasteur, the 1850s, 1860s, the germ theory of disease, the recognition of contact, uh, that hand washing was important uh, to prevent illness. Uh, that that was a, an absolute revelation because previous to that, that, that concept had not existed at all. Uh, and the idea was it spread solely through bad air and miasma. Moving and forward- This is like in the 50s still, right? That was the status quo. Well, that was the status quo until, yeah, I mean, that. well, that was the 1850s. Uh, going through to the early part of the 20th century, there's an American physician, Dr. Charles Chapin, who did a lot of research uh, and, and came to the conclusion that illnesses were either spread by contact or short-range droplets, or perhaps respiratory illnesses were spread in the air. Um, but, you know, he couldn't measure, he didn't have the technology to measure uh, aerosols, to measure germs in the air uh, and, and he eventually just plumped really on the basis of not great evidence uh, that, that this must be droplet uh, infection and, and part of his, his reasoning was listen if we say that it's it's airborne then we'll never get people to wash their hands and he said and anyway people will be very pleased to be rid of the specter of bad air of the specter of miasma and really that set the tone for the next hundred years um, and there's been resistance all the way through. Uh, in the 50s, there was resistance to TB being aerosol uh, 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 transmitted. And in fact, we now know it's only aerosol transmitted. Uh, there was resistance to measles. Uh, we saw resistance to SARS, uh, SARS-1, and now this resistance. There seems to be a very powerful orthodoxy that has hung its hat on airborne transmission being a rarity. And, and, you know, frankly, it would be much better if they were right, because that's a lot easier to deal with. This is a very inconvenient reality that contradicts a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, thought to date and, and kind of threatens, threatens the whole kind of structure of infectious disease transmission. So, you know, scientists, doctors, we're all the same. We're just the same as anybody else. You know, we have our fixed positions, we have our biases, uh, and I think that's what it is. You know, like I say, I'd have been surprised last year if you told me that they'd be quite this entrenched, but they are. So this is far bigger than COVID. So this is a battle that's yeah. been raging, but it, yeah. it just only now has surfaced because we're in the middle yeah. of a pandemic and everybody's yeah. worried about that. So yeah. what, what what would you say to like the uh, common person who is like listening to us that is maybe not in the medical field? We have a lot of yeah. people from like schools joining universities and what are what are the things they can do to protect themselves, to protect their employees, to protect their staff, to protect their students? Yeah, look, I think the main thing is that knowledge is power. Uh, and I think a lot of the fear and confusion of the last year has been that, you know, essentially we've almost been running around like, like a, a, as if we were in medieval times with this great plague and not really knowing, you know, whatever we do doesn't seem to work. And the reason is essentially that we've been trying to solve the wrong problem. Once you realize that aerosol, airborne spread, by which one means uh, spread that can linger in the air for a significant time, can travel certainly at least short distances and infect at a distance. Uh, once you understand that that is at the very least a significant, if not the major source of spread, you can do an awful lot to protect yourself. Um, the, and, and the absolute, you, you know, going back, it's quite interesting because I trained in London in the 1980s and we still have a lot of Nightingale. Now Florence Nightingale, you probably don't know, she was a nurse 
in England, and she went to the Crimean War in the 1860s uh, uh, and uh, did a lot of great things. And she she was a great proponent of bad air, and she said, we've got to, we've got to ventilate these, these wards. And so she designed these wards that were very long, very tall, with, with huge windows that opened at the top, opened at the bottom. Uh, and when I trained in London, there were still a lot of these uh, wards in use, and they were seen very archaic, old-fashioned, uh, and then of course the new hospitals built. And then now these pokey little four-bedded bays, single rooms, uh, pokey little nursing stations, um, and, 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 you know, we've seen a huge amount of infection even before COVID happening in hospitals. So, um, you know, it's kind of ironic that, that way back people did know about this. Um, but what, what you've really, you know, as I say, you know, knowledge is power. And once you understand into this is ventilation and improving the quality of the air that you are breathing, it actually becomes quite simple. Um, uh, and if you take a multi-layered approach to this, so, you know, you want to prevent as much as possible people breathing out bad air um, by putting masks on them. You want to wear a mask yourself uh, to prevent you breathing in bad air in indoor spaces. Uh, you want to ensure that uh, air in indoor spaces as much as possible is as clean as possible and that means ventilation and frankly that means if possible just open the damn window and, and try and keep it open at least to a small degree and get an airflow going through um, and, uh, uh, and if you can't um, if you can't clean the air I, 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 when you're in the in, in an indoor space, you obviously want to also reduce the amount of uh, uh, potential virus that is getting into the space by reducing occupancy, uh, increasing distance between individuals, uh, and, and then also to consider uh, uh, items such as portable air filters or integrated air filters into uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, so that. You know, if you can't actually exchange the air, take it from the inside, uh, put it outside and bring outside air in, if you can't actually do that uh, to a sufficient quantity, then you can also filter the air using high quality filters, MERV 13 filters, head filters, to, uh, to actually filter out the viral particles. So, you know, but once you know this, and once you, you, you know, you're, you're trying to uh, uh, counteract, you know, the, the build-up of, of virus in indoor spaces, things actually fall into place very quickly. And if you take a multi-layered approach, you educate people so that they understand what they need to do. Um, you know, you actually, you get a feeling of control back and that's because you do have actual control. So, you know, you know, it, it isn't hopeless, and, and that's what knowledge brings us. And I think, you know, I, I think that's part of the frustration of the last year has been, look, this is not hard, people, this is simple. Let's just get over our prejudices and just look at the situation on the ground. You know, we wouldn't be in a global pandemic with millions of people dying if this was spread just by touching the floor button. Right, right. And uh, we've, we've got a lot of questions from, from the public as well uh, regarding these, these indoor spaces. A lot of people are asking about things like air conditioning or things like um, uh, air, does, does, does heating somehow affect it? So if you have convection heating, does, does that you know, increase the, the risk of the spread? Yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things is, uh, you know, yeah, any, anything which increases air currents in a room, uh, whether it's your own thermal fluid from the body, from your body heat causing uh, convection in the air, causing air currents, whether it's, it's heating in a room, is going to increase the uh, period that uh, aerosols or will remain 
airborne. So, yeah, um, these are uh, these are factors. Um, I don't think uh, they are. You know, you've got to heat rooms, so and not much you can do about that. Um, I, I think the real key, rather than than uh, uh, trying to to reduce the convection factors, is just to make sure uh, that the air itself. Uh, is clean and, and that it can flow. I mean, one of the things that we've seen is that, that this proliferation of, um, because I mean, yes, you, you actually do want air to flow. So, so one of the things we've seen is this proliferation of plexiglass um, uh, windows everywhere, at every shop counter. And there was an absurd video that surfaced this week of a school in the US where they literally had a plexiglass cubicle for every single child. Um, now those make sense. All you're dealing with is ballistic droplet transmission over a relatively short range, you know, for the cashier. But the problem with that is that they impede airflow so that you will get local concentration right. uh, of aerosol will build up. Um, so, so, you know, airflow, is, airflow isn't bad. I think one just has to recognize that this stuff stays in the air, and we need to clean the air. And uh, how about air quality measurements? Like, what 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 can be done yeah. there? Yeah. So, I mean, going back to your, you know, uh, going back to your uh, quote uh, from Lord Kelvin about you know you can only improve what you can measure. Um, you obviously you can't measure. It's extremely difficult to measure virus in the air. Uh, uh, measuring particles isn't going to help you all kinds of particles that may or may not be virus, it's dust or whatever, slight plates of human skin. Um, so, uh, and the best proxy does seem to be uh, looking at uh, the CO2 concentration in the air. So outdoor air these days uh, has a concentration, best concentration is about 415 parts per million. It was 320 parts per million when I was born in the 1960s, so that's another terrifying story, but yeah. 450. Um, and uh, <coughs> the human out-breath, each time you exhale, each of your half-meter breaths has about 40,000 parts per million of CO2 in it. So in a small space, you actually get quite a build-up uh, of CO2. Uh, in quite a small, quite a short time. So, for instance, if you're in a car that's on recirculate, then uh, you um, uh, are you, you, you're sort of rebreathing your own air, and you can actually get. I mean, I got with my son in a in a small Hyundai Accent, a little tiny little hatch. In 30 minutes, the air conditioning on recirculate. We managed to get from 550 parts per million in the car to 5,500 parts wow, per million. Thousand. So it's massive. I mean, it's massive. You're, you're, you're already talking there about cognitive impairment where you shouldn't be yeah. driving at that level. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a friend uh, posted, uh, pic, tweeted a picture of his Aaron F4. It was, it was two parents, three kids, and the dog in the family car, one hour, 8,500. 8,000? 8,500. Wow. So, I mean, that's, those are really significant levels at which, as you said, you get significant cognitive impairment. Uh, there's another discussion to be had about, uh, you know, car manufacturers really need to look at this because I'm sure this has caused car crashes. But put that aside for a moment, what it shows is that, it, it, you know, it shows the uh, how, I guess how fresh or how, I mean, a way to put it is it shows how fresh or how stale the air is. You know, outside air is fresh. If you keep re-breathing air, it becomes stale. So each time you breathe out, you're breathing out whatever, you know, hopefully no infectious particles, but if you've got COVID, uh, and you're in the infectious phase, you will be breathing out COVID particles. So if the air in the room gets up to about 800 parts per million, then each time that you breathe in, or at each time that you breathe in, you're breathing in about 1% of that breath is somebody else's air mm -hmm. uh, that they just exhale. And and if you if, it, if it's up to sort of 4,000 parts per million, it's it's 
vastly more. So, um, so it increases dramatically. So the risk of infection increases dramatically uh, the more so in the areas. And, and CO2 is, it isn't perfect, but it seems to be a pretty good proxy for how stale the air is. So uh, there was a study done, published in 2020 from China, looking at TB transmission in poorly ventilated university residences. Uh, and they found that if you could reduce the, so, that, so these residences were dreadful, they had CO2 concentrations typically around 3,000 parts per million. Uh, and they found that if you actually reduce the uh, uh, CO2 parts per million by improving the ventilation of these residences to below 1,000, you reduced, uh, and in fact they were aiming down for around 600, you reduced TB transmission by 97%. By 97%, so, wow. Yeah, the, the link is actually on on, uh, on my website, co2radical.com.au. Um, but, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's really dramatic. Now, of course, so, so that tells you, if you like, how stale the air is, how far it is from outside air. Now, of course, if you're filtering the air, mm -hmm. Filtering costs that CO2 level will not be an accurate indicator of the amount of particles. So, you know, if you were fantastically filtering, yes, you know, you could um, put yourself to sleep with a very high level of CO2 in a room and not get infected, and it's still not going to be good for you. But right. in a situation, <coughs> in a situation where you're not um, uh, filtering the air, then that CO2 level is a pretty good indicator so, of how healthy the indoor air quality is. So ideally, I mean, you want it as low as possible. You're going to be doing well in an indoor space to have it below 500, mm -hmm. uh, very well. You'll be doing pretty well having it below 600. I mean, that's good. Once you're getting above 700, 800, you ideally want it lower than that. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting here in a two and a half meter by four meter study, which I've been sitting in since the beginning of the webinar. When I came in here, the CO2 level was 500 and, uh, I think it's 560. It's now 843. Right. That's, so that's, in the time, that's just that's, in the time. That it just in switched to 950. <laughs> Oh, did it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. So, so, so yeah. Probably that's probably I suspect because I just put it up near where I'm exhaling, but it, it's it's going up there. I suspect the next one will be a bit lower, but it's going to get to 950. If you have two people sitting in this room, uh, then you could very quickly get this up to um, uh, you know well over a thousand. I mean, this will be up to 14, 1500 you know, within an hour. So it's extremely, it's actually quite extraordinary when you start measuring this and you go, oh, maybe that's why I always feel tired on the long car journey. Oh, maybe that's why when I'm studying after half an hour, I want to put my head down and go to sleep. You know, a lot of things become clear. And, you know, I think that's a great quote of yours. You know, you can't measure, you can't uh, improve what you can't measure. Um, so I think having a CO2 monitor, uh, yeah, there we go. I moved it away from myself, it's down to 902. So I think that was because it was dried in my exhale breath. But anyway, so it's, it's at 902. Um, so, yeah, so, so ideally, you know, obviously I can't infect myself. So it doesn't really matter in, in that sense that I'm here on my own. But of course, if I'm asymptomatic with COVID uh, and I'm sitting here, Rebreathing, rebreathing. The CO two level goes up. Somebody comes in to ask me a question, spends ten minutes chatting, goes out again. That's not a good thing. Um, there's a great picture uh, which was tweeted by uh, Kate Cole, who is like the national treasure of Australia. She's the president elect of our Association of uh, Occupational Hygienists, uh, which again, before 
2020. I've never even heard of a modification by doing this. Anyway, um, she tweeted a picture. She went to pick up her kids from their after school club. And she got to this room. It was like a kind of church hall type thing, pretty big, high ceiling, like four meters, big room, probably 20 meters long. I don't know, they've been doing judo or something in there. Um, there was nobody in there. She was late. Uh, and she took a reading with a CO2 meter and it was 1800. Oh, so wow. this was a completely empty room with a CO2 level of 1800, which you would never know. So she tweeted that and it's had over a million impressions since because it's a really stunning thing. It's, it's just like, it's like there's this whole new world that's kind of opened up where you go, oh, that's not very good. You know, and, and, and knowing that actually gives you, gives you a lot of power. And that's, that's you know, so I, I, I'm optimistic as long as we can get this message through and I think we're starting to. Yeah, that, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it seems like the tide is a bit changing and it seems like people are recognizing that. And we are uh, slowly approaching, you know, the uh, final part of the webinar. So this is where I'm gonna go over some of the questions that have come in uh, from the uh, from the listeners. And I still remind you, you can still, uh, still ask these things. So uh, Jillian is asking, is there an optimal airflow rate? So, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, uh, uh, it, that's slightly outside, well, that is outside my area of expertise in terms of, of you know, air change rates per hour in a space. Um, the more, the better. Uh, you know, really, you, you've just got to do whatever it takes to keep the CO2 level down. You want to you want to be looking, at, if possible, at at least six air changes per hour, uh, or if you can, 10 to 12, certainly in a, in a, in a hospital or clinical environment. Um, but, you know, that's, I think, that's where monitoring comes in. And that's why it's so important. I know this sounds like an advertorial, but, you know, that is why it is so important to be able to monitor. Um, I, I was involved in a resuscitation in our resuscitation room uh, recently, and uh, it was quite a fraught event. Uh, we had about eight people in there. It's quite a big room, actually, and we got up to a thousand on the CO2 level. And this was a patient with respiratory illness, uh, and there were eight milling around. It. So, you know, uh, you've got to be able to measure it, and you've got to, you know, the more airflow you can have, the better. Open the windows, get the wind whistling. Okay, so this uh, kind of ties into a next interesting comment that we have from uh, Eric here. If local authorities could set conditions of air quality in restaurants, hotels, other indoor public spaces, uh, we should be open. We should be able to open such businesses and save the local economy. So, what is your opinion on that? Do you think that by by putting CO2 meters like mandatory into restaurants and public spaces, we could open faster? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it, I think the important thing to understand is this is not a panacea. It's not going to solve everything. It's part of a wider strategy with, you know, reducing occupancy rates, wearing masks, uh, uh, and all this. But it sure is going to help because once you're educated, you're really not going to walk into a bar. You know, there's COVID around. You're not going to walk into a bar if the CO2 two meter that's display above the bar is showing 1400 or 1800. You're just going to look at that and you're going to go, I'm out of here. Um, so I really think uh, the key for this is, uh, I, I think I think there should be mandatory public display of the CO2 level with information about what that means in all public spaces, private or public, um, uh, and, and a big education campaign to help people understand what that is. And yes, I do think that that would be a significant benefit to opening faster. Right, yeah, that, that does make complete sense. Um, there are other people asking about uh, links to the articles you mentioned. So we will uh, probably email, do an emailing campaign after after the webinar. We will uh, share with you all of the um, articles that were mentioned in, in this webinar. Yeah. 
Then there are um, questions regarding whether or not humidity has any effect on the virus itself. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, think the, I, I guess, the, 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 yeah, um, you know, in, 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 in high, it, it is, I've just completely gone blank, actually, on whether it's high or lower humidity, uh, which, uh, you know, the way one has a kind of uh, kind of brain freeze, so I've gone blank on that. But whichever humidity it is, um, I think higher humidity is better for the virus, lower is, lower is worse. You know, these are significant factors in a, you know, in an environment. Um, against the concentration, I mean, these affect how long the virus lives. I, I think these are really secondary. Um, you know, in the same way as, as heat uh, tends to kill the virus and, and cold uh, um, uh, tends to help it live longer. You know, we see extreme situations like meatpacking plants where the environment's very cold uh, and they have these mass outbreaks and that may well be a contributory factor. Um, I think in most, you know, situations, there isn't, you can't manipulate humidity and temperature in the same way as you can uh, manipulate air exchange and, and air refresh rate. So I think these are important. I mean, I think these are the factors. I think compared to uh, ventilation flows, uh, I, I think they are less important. Right. Now, there just came in another interesting question uh, from Murillo, if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Sorry if not. Um, is there a way to know what is the concentration of CO2 in the air without equipment and that kind of goes back to your story with this uh, lady coming in to that 1.8 thousand I, I wouldn't say no probably right no i don't think so i mean you know it's like you know you walk into a room and people go oh god you know open the window and it's not necessarily because it smells it just like doesn't it's feel right, right. You know, that feeling if you're in your car that feeling when you've been driving in the car for three hours you think, I should have stopped for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee an hour ago. And you just go, oh, I just look terrible. You know, well, probably you've got a CO2 level there of six, seven, eight thousand. Uh, and that is much too high. So if it's really high, you can tell, otherwise you can't. Right, yeah, that's that's what that's what I would uh, suspect. But, uh, but I, just, I just want to come back to that. Right. Too. There's a study done by Professor Allen at Harvard, who's, who's published a lot on this, on the indoor air quality, uh, looking at the performance of airline pilots in the simulator with actually at not very high levels of CO2, mm -hmm. with, with you know, around 1,500 to 2,000 relatively. Um, and he showed a 70% decrease in their ability to pass a simulator check, so to pass a flight test. 70 percent 70 percent reduction in their ability to pass a flight test uh when i think it, i can't remember the detail it's somewhere up around 2000 as opposed to down at 700. so you know it doesn't have to get really i mean 2000 is high but it's not as high as 6000 or 8000 which it can get to um so you know you you won't be able to tell you walk into a space which has a co2 level of 2000 you're not going to be able to tell uh, but it's going to have a significant effect on your cognition and on your risk of becoming infected. Right. So, uh, from a few other questions that came actually in beforehand, before the uh, webinar itself, uh, one question that I really like myself. So, what are your recommendations on how to um, effectively communicate this aerosol danger to the broad public? Yeah. Um... Uh, there have been a lot of kind of guerrilla, uh, guerrilla ad, ad marketing campaigns by, by people. So, uh, 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 so for instance, UK, the NHS campaign was hands, face, face. Uh, you know, um, uh, wash your hands, wear a mask, keep, keep your distance. Uh, and the Fresh Air NHS campaign in the UK uh, made it into hands, uh, uh, hands, face, face, replace. So replace the air as well. 
in other words, okay. commuter benefit. Um, uh, uh, so, so I think we're going to be seeing an awful lot more of that. I think the best analogy, really, uh, is to think a bit about cigarette smoke. But cigarette smoke is quite a good analogy. It lingers in the air um, uh, like aerosols. Uh, and so, you know, you know how it is when you can smell just faintly, you know, if you're not a smoker, you can smell somebody smoking 20, 30 meters away if they're upwind, sometimes more. Um, so that's, you know, you, 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 that's quite a good analogy. It doesn't stand up completely because some of the smell or the smell is due to the gases uh, and the way that it lingers in the clothes is due to, due to uh, uh, gases. Uh, in the cigarette smoke, but it's quite a good analogy. So I would use, uh, I would use cigarette smoke, big cigarette smoke, the way it swirls around, and hangs in a bar in a room. Uh, and again, there are some good videos on my website, uh, which have been published, which just illustrate that. Uh, and so showing people that, you show people a 10 second video and it's like, oh yeah, I get that. It's really easy to understand. I mean, so this stuff is so So you mean those simulation videos or? or uh... yeah, yeah. Yeah, with with smoke yeah they're on my site too um but we can email them now yeah that's 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 that that is yeah that was also into the question as well so visual aids typically help yeah um, then there was an interesting question from colleagues in America. Uh, how did Australia convince most of its citizens to embrace the harsh lockdown measures for stopping community spread? So what is your uh, view on that? Because in the States they didn't have that uh, much of luck. Yeah. Um, Australians are really civic minded. They're really public spirited, warm hearted people. Who, who love to do things for society and help the main. And so I think it's part of, <coughs> it's, part of um, uh, it's part of the national culture. And the other thing, and this is quite obedient, this is quite interesting, is uh, people think of Australians as quite a kind of happy-go-lucky and a bit disrespectful, and they kind of are. But they're actually also quite respectful of authority and they do follow rules. Now they're disrespectful of people in authority, but they do follow rules. And so uh, I think it really, you know, everybody understood that we're in a great position in Australia, uh, that we're relatively isolated. Uh, we have got a relatively small population and we can do it. And of course, at the same time, we also had the example of New Zealand, which shut down just before us. Um, and of course, we're Australian, so we don't want to be outdone by the New Zealanders. So that. <laughs> that that does help. So we have uh, come to basically the end of the webinar. And I see that in the comments sections, it's more even started to become more of a discussion between the commenters themselves. And that's 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 nice. That's really nice to drive the discussion. Yeah. So uh, maybe some, you know, last words to our, all of our listeners. What 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 do you how, how do you see the future of this? How should we be hopeful? Should be fearful or something in between? Yeah, <laughs> You know, I think we should be hopeful. Um, uh, in the end, we are pretty smart. We're a pretty smart species. And you know, we squabble and we fight and all this kind of stuff, but we are pretty smart. And I think that this is, this, we will get this. We do need to get the word out. I think that everybody who has attended this webinar needs to realize that they are among the several hundred people in the world with the highest levels of knowledge about this and that everything that they can do in their societies, in their social media environment to kind of spread the word, to educate people will actually have a huge effect. So, you know, we're now living in a time where individuals really can change the narrative. So I just encourage everybody to do whatever you can to help educate people and just to help improve air quality, you know, so we can all try and eventually put this nightmare behind us. 
Well, these are really lovely uh, words, Dr. Berger. And uh, with that, I thank you very much for uh, joining us at uh, such a late hour. Uh, it was very, That's very, uh, very helpful and very informative. I myself learned a lot of things. I hope that our uh, listeners uh, did as well. So uh, I am saying thank you and goodbye to you. And thank to you. Uh, and to our uh, listeners, we will have uh, this webinar up on YouTube, probably the edited version in, 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 uh, during next week. Uh, we will send an uh, emailing uh, regarding all of the, uh, the articles that were mentioned and a follow-up. And in case you know you or someone you know missed it, you will be able to watch this uh, afterwards. And we uh, have another webinar planned with Dr. Jose Luis Jimenez in uh, two weeks on the uh, 2nd of March. So uh, that is it from our side. Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening and stay safe, everybody. Goodbye.